If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 9. I borrowed this message. I didn't, this isn't, I can't take any credit for this one. I have borrowed this one. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I had a similar message like that that I shared a number of years ago. You ever wonder why bad things happen to good people? Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at 10 reasons bad things happen to good people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your precious word once again. Thank you for your word in which it's powerful. It's able to help us guide us throughout our life. And Father, I pray it will accomplish what you want it to accomplish in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's many things in life that is clear to understand. For example, a math problem simply just all adds up. So there's some things that it's easy to understand. And then there's other things that's very, very difficult. There's things in life that are really hard to understand. Hard to understand why anybody would go to an Amish school and shoot those children. Hard to understand about 9-11. A lot of people in those Twin Towers died that day. Why did I get cancer? Why did my child die? Why did my spouse leave me? Why do I always have bad luck? I know there's one here I've heard him say, if it wasn't bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Does seem that way, doesn't it, sometimes? Well, those are hard questions, and there's really no simple answer to those. We're going to make an attempt to try to find some of the answers. I believe that God's Word has answers for everything, everything in life. We can't always find the answers there sometimes. We have to pray and ask God to show us. The first reason, it's common. In Job chapter 5, we read this. Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Isn't that interesting? Job's probably one of the oldest books of the Bible. It would have to be put up there, if it was in chronological order, it would have to be put up there probably right next to Genesis in chronological order. Very old book. A lot of wisdom in that old book. Then in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation also, make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. You know, sometimes we think we're the only ones that have trouble. But I can tell you we're not. We all have problems. All kinds of problems. Anybody here ever have a flat tire? <laughs> Yeah. Anybody have the stomach flu? Cold, sore throat, pneumonia. See? See? Financial hardship. Maybe just a bad hair day. I hope that washes out, Becky. Does that wash out? Oh, it's a way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your your concern for those that are suffering. This terrible disease has affected so many people. 
It all started in the garden. Man thought he knew more than God. Took of the forbidden tree. He was told not to. Why is it? We always want to partake of the forbidden fruit. We can trace sin and sickness to that day. That dreadful day. So the Lord chased them out of the garden. He put guardians at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Lest they would also eat of the tree of what? Life. Lest they also would eat of the tree of life. We know that sin and sickness wasn't part of God's program. He had a better program. But man changed that. And I see so much of, when I study the life of Christ, he touched so many people and so many people are healed. It's almost really a touch of heaven. That's what heaven is going to be like. There'll be no sickness. No more sickness. No more pain. For the former things, he said, have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. So when these people got healed, when he walked on this earth, they had just a little glimpse of heaven, what heaven must be like. Because of the curse of sin, we will struggle with many hardships in our life. We all know what that's like. We've been through there. We've had those times in our life, and we think, well, maybe it's over, but it's over when God says it's over. The second one, it's a chastisement. It's a chastisement. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son whom he receiveth, Hebrews 12, 6. Now, when I was in uh, Job chapter 5, I was reading on a little further in that same chapter and came up with verse 17, which goes along with our second one. <laughs> Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. And this is Job chapter 5. God judged Adam's sin. He judged Cain's sin. He judged David's sin. He judged Israel's sin. He judged the world's sin with the flood. And he judged our sin. Calvary. I don't know about you, but I never got away with anything when I was growing up. I tried to hide a lot of things, and still, this Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. My parents usually knew what went on at school. At the time, my father was a painting contractor, and he had did a lot of the painting in the school. He got to know who the administration people were. He knew the principal of the school, and when things happened there, things happened at home, too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Much get away with much. My parents knew what was going on in town, too. They had spies. <laughs> yep, I thought I'd take the van for a run one winter, one winter evening up to the church parking lot and was spinning some donuts. <laughs> oh, yes. And the caretaker of the church happened to see me. And he knew that turquoise van belonged to Roy Woolmer, and he knew that Roy wasn't doing it. <laughs> oh, yes, I couldn't get away with much of anything. But you know what? None of us get away with anything. Our Heavenly Father sees everything. He sees everything. What we think we're getting away with, we really aren't. Jack Coe used to say there's a payday coming for everything you said and done. We don't get away with anything with God either. Did you know that Charles Spurgeon said the Christian will never sin successfully? I never heard a quote quite like that, but I, I chuckled when I read that. A Christian will never sin successfully. God hates sin, as we should. 
And if you were to kick the person responsible for most of your troubles in the backside, you probably wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. <laughs> Did you catch that? You are responsible for many of the things that happens. Sometimes we just make foolish choices. But then there's times that we're not responsible for that choice. Somebody else made the choice. And then there's the third one. It is a consequence. A consequence. We didn't necessarily do that particular sin that caused the problem, but we suffer because somebody else did. I think of Achan, who took things. They were told not to take anything. But he did. And God punished the whole camp because of what he did. So he punished the rest for what one did. Doesn't that sound like Adam? We've all been punished because of what Adam did. We've all sinned and come short of the glory. So what Adam did, we're all punished. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes we suffer because of what somebody else did. Sometimes we suffer because of others. The example we have is children suffer because of parents. Children suffer because of parents' neglect. Parents neglect a lot of different things. It's always sad when I hear that Parents neglect children. They're left in a hot car when it's 100 degrees. These children suffer because of the parents' neglect. Children suffer because of parents' abuse. Abuse comes in many different forms. Emotional, physical abuse. Children suffer because of the parents. Children also suffer because of addictions. Children suffer because of parents' addictions. Can you imagine living in a home where daddy's a drunk most of the time? I am very grateful that I didn't have to live that way. I didn't have a dad for a drunk. I had a dad that loved me. And I can't imagine children living in a family like this. But they suffer because of the parents. Others suffer because of others' mistakes. The photographer for a national magazine was assigned to get photos of a huge forest fire. Smoke at the scene had hampered him, and he asked his home office to hire a plane Arrangements were made, and he was told to go at once to a nearby airport where the plane would be waiting. When he arrived at the airport, a plane was warming up near the runway. He immediately jumped in with his equipment and yelled, let's go, let's go. The pilot swung the plane into the wind, and soon they were in the air. The photographer said, fly over the north side of the fire. Make three or four low-level passes. Why, asked the pilot. Because I'm going to take pictures. I'm a photographer. And photographers take pictures. After a pause, the pilot said, You mean you're not the instructor? <laughs> oh. Photographer was in a little hurry to get a plane that day. I'd make you both think, wouldn't it? <laughs> you see, sometimes people suffer because of somebody else's bad choices. As a result, they both would have suffered that tragedy. We think of Sodom Hussein. We think of the people that suffered under his regime. How about Adolf Hitler? How about the people that suffered under him? How about the terrorists, innocent people, being shot in malls as terrorists go in and open fire and all the innocent people are shot because of terrorists? 
the Amish school shooting. Didn't they make a movie called Forgiven? Didn't it? Did any of you get the chance to see that? I'd like to see that. It's very good. Jesus suffered because of others. And he was nailed to a cross. So I can tell you that Jesus understands what it's like to suffer because of others. Fourthly, it's a cure. According to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me try to get there quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You see, sometimes God gives us things to keep us from certain things in our life that he knows will bring us harm. We might consider it suffering, but God considers it maybe perhaps a safeguard. He's protecting us from something far greater. Did you know that James Dobson's mother prayed this prayer? Lord, if he is ever to bring you shame, take him now. Wow. What a godly mother. Fifthly, it is a conflict. Job, no sin on his part, but it was a test of God. God was testing Job. You see, God was bragging about Job at the time. And the devil heard it. The devil came by and the devil said, well, if you do, if you take these things from him, he'll curse you. No, he won't, God said. Yes, he will, the devil said. And then you know the story. It was difficult. Job lost everything he had. Can you imagine losing everything you had? He was a very wealthy man. He lost it all. He lost it all. Even his wife said, Job, why don't you just curse God? God. He had it from all angles. What a challenge. We have challenges from Satan. In 1 Peter 5, 8, we read, Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He can use sickness. He can use finances. He can use death. He can use a complaining family member or maybe friends. He can use all these things, and we can see that in the book of Job. Sixthly, it's character building. We have challenges that we have from God. Abraham, his test of faith was to offer his only son, Isaac. Disease is another example. We have financial hardships. Why does God test us? Do you ever hear the, the quote, no pain, no gain? Ever hear that? No pain, no gain. The trying of your faith worketh patience. James says, chapter 1 and verse 3. And in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. You see, God is wanting to make us like Christ. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And then we have the example of the potter. 
has to put pressure on the clay to mold it and to make it. And we, of course, are the clay, and our Lord is the potter. In James 1.12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised for him and them that love him. James 1.12. And then, seventhly, he said unto, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, as he revealed himself to Paul. It's compelling, is the next word you want to put in your outline. It's compelling. Acts 9 and 5. It's the Lord who tries to compel us to go a certain way. And when we try to go the other way, it's hard because that's not the way God wants us to go. Another example is that of a frozen lawnmower wheel. You ever have a wheel on a lawnmower that didn't want to run or turn? Maybe a better example would be one of those shopping carts. We're usually fortunate enough to always get the one that's got bubble gum on or either is rusted fast. And we're going through the shopping uh, store. Why don't you go get another one? Well, we're halfway through the store. You know. So you still push it onward. You still make it go. And you know what? The Lord does that with us sometimes. He has a direction that he wants us to go. We don't always want to go that direction. <laughs> But he wants us to go that way. And you know what? When we don't go the way he wants us to go, it's hard going. Because it's not the way he wants us to go. He wants us to go a different way. And so it's hard. It's hard going. But he compels us to go a certain way. And then eighthly, comprehension. It helps us to understand others so that we can minister to them. The, the scripture is 2 Corinthians 1.4. Who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. Wow. How better to understand people when you've gone through it yourself. I've often said to people, I said, you know what? Why don't you go talk to them? You know the situation better than I do. I never had that type of loss, but you did. I know that you could help them immensely with what you went through. And so I try to get certain people to go talk to certain people. Because nobody knows it better than those who experienced it, who went through it. As my wife was receiving her treatment. And I'm sure Jean thought the same thing. When those machines are running across you, what are you thinking? Are they going to get it all? I hope they get it all. I hope they stop it all. I hope it, it all goes in remission. I hope I don't have to deal with this again. The things that go through your mind as I'm sure it did with you, Brenda, to get it all. No one knows more than those who pass through that same road, who travel the same road. It helps us to understand Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3.10. We think of the martyrs, the many of those that died for the cause of Christ. And then ninthly, it's a, condo it's a condolent for his glory. As was the blind man we read in John chapter 9. Maybe God wants to do a miracle through us. And the miracle cannot be done without the suffering first. The miracle. Back to, the, to John chapter 9. Did you notice 
he said that neither this man nor his parents sin. Now, I thought every man sins. Well, you have to understand that what he was talking about with this man's blindness wasn't to a particular sin, is what he was referring to. His blindness wasn't caused by a particular sin. All men sin. But his wasn't caused by a particular sin. We read in another place that he'd passed the, the judgment on to the third and fourth generation. Don't know why some things God does things like that. Well, he'll pass that judgment on even on to the third and fourth generation. Three, four generations suffer because of a particular sin. Don't know why God does things like that, because he's God. You understand in the Old Testament that there were certain times he told them that they had to destroy all of them, every one of them. And when you're studying the Old Testament, you're thinking, but Lord, women and children too? He said, destroy them all. I don't think we grasp what the Lord sees. You see, the Lord knew that this corrupt religion would filter down through and finally get to the children of Israel. He knew this corrupt Canaanite religion would, would sooner or later come down into the children of Israel because the Lord sees the end from the beginning. Do you understand that? He sees differently than we see. He sees the problems, the corruption, and, so, and knows exactly what's going to cause his children to err in such a way that when he told them to go into that city, when he said destroy them all, that's exactly what he meant. Destroy everyone. Not one is to survive. Because he looked down through the years and times and saw the damage that it was going to do. He knew that. And that's why it had to be, they had to be destroyed. But man always seems to think they know better than God. And so they spared what they thought should be spared. And as a result, God knew it was going to be that way. Many were corrupted because of it. Then lastly, it's concealed. There's times when we don't know why, and we may not know until we reach heaven. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. You see, there are some things we can know. God loves us. God is in control. God knows about us. You see, when you can't trace God's hand, you can always trust his heart. And how are we to react in the midst of suffering? So I'm closing with this, the book of James. If you can go with me all the way back to the book of James. This is my conclusion. James. I'm getting there. There we are. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. A servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting, my brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, and patience here worth perfect work, that may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Be patient for the test. Be impatient for the test. And then... In the last few verses, ask for the answers. Number five, verse, verse five, rather. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. Verse 12, blessed is a man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So that's our looking to the future. And then we're not to blame God. Verse 13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. And don't get angry. Verse 19, 
Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Verse 22, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So do the word, not just be a hearer of it. Do the word and also do the work. Pure religion, verse 27, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. So not only be hearers, but be doers as well. All right. This time we'll take uh, prayer requests.